Okay, today I'm here with Saffron Rossi, Dr. Saffron Rossi. Uh, she's the core of a core faculty member at Pacifica Institute and in the Jungian and Archetypal Studies Master's and PhD program. She teaches courses on mythology, archetypal cosmology, and astrology, and scholarly praxis. For many years, she was the curator of, just, of the Joseph Campbell, James Hillman, and Maria Gambutas manuscript collections at Opus Archive. Uh, her writing and scholarly studies focus on Greek mythology, archetypal psychology, astrology, and goddess traditions. Saffron is the author of The Core Goddess, a mythology and psychology, co-editor of Jung on Astrology, and editor of Joseph Campbell's Goddesses, Mysteries of the Feminine Divine. Saffron has published articles in Jungian, archetypal, and astro astrological journals, and lectures across the U.S. and internationally in Europe, South America, and Australia. And she is also a consulting archetypal psychological astrologer. And you can visit more of her work at the archetypal eye.com. And she's also at Instagram on is it archetypal eye or the archetypal eye? I think it's the archetypal eye. <laughs> <laughs> either or, you can try either or. Um, so you guys heard my dog barking in the background. So she's been doing that lately. So don't be startled if you hear her. <laughs> Uh, she's got great timing. Um, but I'm really excited to chat with you today. Um, the, this book, I feel like, is so uh, timely. Uh, I know it came out. Did it come out last year? It came out in the in September of 21, you know, so in the sort of belly of COVID. And as a lot of people and their creative projects, I just think it's like we've been having slow births in some way that the work was done, but that the world seems to be getting to know it more slowly. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, in the case for, for us in this interview, we've danced around it a little bit, but the timing I feel like uh, is is right right now as we go into spring uh, mm -hmm. and, and celebrate her uh, in her rising aspects. So uh, today, just to be clear, we're talking about the Core Goddess. This is the cover of the book. Um, and before we get started, uh, just a little bit about myself is I'm also a Jungian psychotherapist. Uh, I'm in Florida and I am in my PhD process um, at Pacifica in the clinical program. Uh, and I'm also in training to be an analyst. So I'm excited to talk with Saffron today. Uh, and I just admire your kind of your background and the way that you have studied this material. Uh, and to look at it from a different perspective than uh, maybe the, the, the super clinical one, uh, which is sometimes where I go, but I like both, and right. specifically uh, Quare Goddess. So um, there she is. Um, <laughs> um, to get started, why don't you tell me a little bit about what brought you to the Quare and what drove you to, to write about uh, the topic for the book? Yeah, well, um... I, I guess the the sort of ground actually emerged out of my dissertation. I, I wrote my dissertation on a triad goddesses in Greek mythology. And um and, and mythology is my background, that's my training, uh, and Greek mythology in particular. And I was very interested in, you know, what are these triad goddesses? There are so many in Greek myth, so it's this really strong motif. And I was curious about what is this image of plurality and how does that relate to women's experiences of themselves? And so that was my dissertation. And then, uh, you know, it takes a few years to kind of, I think, rest and recoup from the dissertation writing process, as I'm sure you're, uh, you know, uh, can already tell. And um, when I was, and, and during the time of working on my dissertation, I was the curator at the archives, as you mentioned in my bio. And I was in the collection of uh, Jane Hollister Wheelwright, who was one of the really important Jungian analysts. She was in analysis with Jung, and she was one of the co-founders of the San Francisco Jung Institute, which was the first Jung Institute in the US. So like super important figure, historically speaking. And she had an essay in her collection that was actually a talk that she gave and it never got published. And it was about the maiden, the, the archetype of the maiden. And she 
was talking about Jung's discussion of the core uh, of the maiden figure. And in my reading this and thinking about what I had written about in my dissertation, I realized that while I had been looking at the mythology of these figures, that the archetypal, uh, one of the archetypal essences of what I was not aware of, but like dancing around or circumambulating was the core. And that led me to um, going into uh, Jung's discussion of the maiden. Um, what is this figure in our psyche? What are the figures in Greek myth that personify the values that belong to the maiden or Kore? So that, that it was this kind of slow unfolding that then um, got very focused, so. Well, I am very selfishly interested in that whole process. Um, <laughs> we'd be here all day. <laughs> I'm wondering how that affected you as you write your dissertation, because I know how much these archetypes affect us as we research and write about them. Uh, but yeah. this being such a central archetype, I can yes. only imagine. Yes. Uh, for our listeners, uh, why don't we start with talking about or trying to define uh, what the core is and what you right. discovered in your research. Right. So I think the, um, so the, I, I'm talk, I, the, when I talk about the core, many of your listeners may be familiar with the core as another name for Persephone, right? The great core goddess of Greek religion and myth. But when I'm talking about the core, I'm actually not talking about her specifically, even though she is a kind of paradigmatic example of this archetype. So the core archetype as, a, as a, a, a pattern is perhaps more familiar for people if we think about the words, the virgin or the maiden. So core is the Greek word for virgin or maiden. And so the core as an archetypal figure and a pattern um, is a youthful figure who is unto herself. And by unto herself, I mean, she belongs to none. She's undivided from herself. And that would be the psychological and metaphorical understanding of virginity. We may think of it, we tend to think of it in more biological or concrete terms, but metaphorically speaking, to be virgin is to be inviolable. And it's to be um, holy and pure in oneself. So the core is the pat is the archetypal figure that personifies that and all of the values that we would see as a kind of constellation um, connected to that sense. And I wanted to also say that the reason why I wanted I used the word core is because I think of our habit. Um, to both perhaps literalize virgin when we think about it. And also I think the ways that it's been um, uh, diminished in terms of its meaning. And sometimes these older words that are unfamiliar to us, I think can help lead us back to some of the more uh, sort of mysterious potency because it isn't so familiar and yet it is at the same time. So that was part of my reasoning to want to bring in this word um, um, to kind of break us out of whatever our associations are to maiden and virgin, which, you know, culturally speaking, at least in the West, are not particularly great. <laughs> so. Yeah, and I think going that, that, that route, especially etymolo etymologically, um, helps us amplify, helps us uh, right. a different perspective that is connected maybe more with the archaic aspects. Um, yes. When we think about um, what it means to be kind of sovereign psychologically or unto the self in yes. this way, yes. um, what, what would you say that that means to you? Like, how would yes. we, how would we uh, explain that to the listeners? Yeah, so I, I understand that to be um, being in a um, sort of a, a sense of self that, that, that we, are in, we have a relationship to our sense of self and how we are in the world 
that we don't um, belong to another, <laughs> meaning that um, other people's um, standards, rules, expectations um, are not the, the bar uh, by which we uh, uh, define ourselves, nor where it is that we gain our sense of identity. So to be in relationship to the Cori archetype is essentially to be in touch with our um, beingness as an individual, unique, and autonomous reality, right? Like who am I? Not out of my uh, definitions of who I am in relationship to my family, my mother, my father, my siblings, even my ancestors, or social um, ideas, um, um, professional role, that while all of those things are, of course, profoundly important dimensions of our being, the core personifies the essential beingness of who I am, distinct from all of those various roles and parts of my persona and identity. So, so that would be the, the, the psychological sense. Like, what is it to be in touch with the truth of my beingness? And, what I, and, and that would include then being in relationship with my emotional reality, my values, my ideals, my point of view. And that that um, emerges out of what I know to be uh, core, the core dimensions of my being, and then, you know, gets to be woven into and related and negotiated with the world and the relationships we have with people in our lives. Yeah. And when I'm, when you're talking, I'm thinking about my, my work with clients and how this is such a, um, basic kind of building block of therapy when we think about belief systems, constructs, conditions that kind of get encrusted around the core. I always remember Woodman talking about there's this crust around the archetype yes. and how we get there, whether, you know, through analytical work or clinical work, it's, it's work to get closer to that core truth of what that self is, right. uh, whether we have a deep and kind of lasting relationship with that thing, uh, I think depends on how well we can work through those things and what Jung called individuation uh, and what the real reality of individuation is. Uh, and not necessarily to become an individual, but to be able to take off these wrappings of these groups that create shadow right. and these other right. institutions or constructs. So when you, talk about um, Jung in the book in, in relationship to the Kore. Uh, mm -hmm. Talk about what his understanding was uh, in terms of that and individuation. Yeah, yeah. So, and before I do that, I just wanted to, because I, I love that you brought in how Marion Woodman talked about the crust that forms around our core. And I just wanted to touch on something there, which is that um, my sense is, you know, approaching this, this archetype and the way it shows up in life and what we see in the myths that, um, you know, personify this archetypal pattern and, and the values that belong to it is that there's always a problem with being in touch with our core -hood. There's always problems, challenges, blockages to being in relationship to that kind of essential uh, truth and sense of sovereignty. And so that's both in the myths and it's also in our lived experience. And to me, that is really important because I think that helps us recognize that the ways in which we feel disconnected from our sovereignty or our creative vitality or our truth um, or our sense of autonomy in relationship to our family and culture that's actually like, in other words, like how our core hood is denied us. That's actually the very way, those are the very conditions by which the core emerges. See, and, and to me, that's really important that even though we might be talking about a figure um, who is related to that sense of incredible purity and essential being, we come into touch with that because of the ways in which we're out of touch with it. And that I think is really essential. So it's not about 
like nailing it and getting pure and like, you know, becoming, you know, totally aligned with the core. I think throughout our life, it's this dance of being closer and farther away from it and experiences that keep us um, coming, like cracking into the crust that just forms by the nature of life around the way we are connected to, you know, our essence. So I just wanted to say that because I think in our, um, I think we can so idealize this dimension of our being and this figure and the figures that carry it that we think, oh, I'm too broken or I've spent too many decades kind of fulfilling other people's expectations. I can't be in touch with this figure. And, and, and I think that's an error in our vision that she comes through out of our out of the challenges. And, and I think that's important that we can recognize that. Um, yeah, so I, I, I wanted to, yeah. Yeah, I love that you brought that in actually. Um, and kind of recently in the last year or so working a lot with the relational aspect, especially with my clients and thinking about how we lose self and regain a sense of self and how that whole process is, kind of like just us being here around matter in general and that that's what yes. we do we have to have something to push off against i think is what jung would say so in the process yes. of losing something we can really feel in its return what it actually is or appreciate it that's right and i think so and and i think you know an image that just came to me that that i that is holding both of the ways that we've just talked about this this is persephone's annual descent and rising up she's constantly moving in a kind of cycle of renewal. And if we think about that as being something of our um, ongoing relationship to these parts of our deep nature, that it's not, it's not a point of arrival that you then like stick at and stay with, that you know, we're, we're always kind of dancing or rising and falling in connection to it. And I think that's another way to think about Persephone's movements between the worlds that never really comes to a resting point, but a constant kind of renewal, a constant dipping in and flowering and dipping back down. And, you know, so, so that's part of the, the mythic um, background to this pattern too. Yeah. And the, the turning, I guess what the alchemists would call turning of the stone. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so kind of, as you bring that up, I think it is, um, a good segue into Jung and it, yeah. what he considers the relationship of soul to the core. So it's very interesting when Jung, and this was part of what Jane Hollister Wheelwright's piece that like blew my mind in the archives led me to, which was in Jung's one essay on the psychological aspects of the core, he makes this phenomenal point that the core is a self figure for women and it has a power equivalent to that of the mother. So basically what Jung was identifying was the, the power of both the core and mother archetypes in um, women's psyches, we could say, and how the core is also a figure who personifies the self, the self as that uh, sort of image of inner divinity, the sort of the highest numinosum we could say uh, in, in, in the theory of individuation, the self is, is sort of the center point around which the entire psyche is organized and, and kind of dancing around as well. Um, and so Jung identified the core as a self figure, um, and uh, that is extraordinary. And what's interesting, and, and you probably, you know, given your deep reading in the literature of the field, because you are amazing at that in your, your book stacks and, and the way that you're drawing out these core ideas, um, who writes about the core like that? I mean, that is a very rare, very few works pick up this theme of Jung's. I mean, Jane Hollister Wheelwright does, Irene Claremont de Castillejo, obviously Marion Woodman, but I think in many, many ways, this whole notion of the core in relationship to the self 
and how that relates to um, women's psyches. And then of course, how that might live in the psyches of men. That's a very slim thread in the literature as we have it in, you know, Jungian and archetypal studies. And that's kind of amazing. Um, and so there's something about that, that I've come to think that, that it's because the core as an archetypal reality and the way that we are coming into consciousness of it through our individual lives and how that's iterated in the collective, that's actually arising. That this, it's like we are in a period where we are in the midst of the constellation of an archetype that at one point was very front and center as Greek religion shows us but had really fallen into the background, partly because of the, the power of the mother archetype in our Western culture, but I think across the globe. And there's a big shift happening in, in the collective unconscious, and that's moving through us individually. So, so Jung you know, kind of touches on some of those things, um, but uh, yeah, so. Yeah, I, it's just fascinating to, to listen to you talk about that and, and and the other ways you've seen it written about uh, in the field, because it's a big part of my, my own research, um, also focusing on chaos and emergence, uh, mm. or that aspect of um, self-emergence and that kind of autonomous organization process yeah. that you're talking about. Right. Uh, and that, you know, well, my archetype, Hecate, that I write about, you know, she's yeah. not the mother either, and she's another right. aspect of soul, just the same, and, and yes. how they both interact, too, outside of the mother is important, as we see with Persephone uh, as right. well. Right. <laughs> yes. But I wanted to, you, you talk about um, different aspects of how do we get closer to the core, or how do we understand it uh, in our own process and practices uh, and one thing you did mention was contained integrity which i love uh, yes. i like to focus on that as well so um, can you explain more about that containment and why it's significant to the to the core right so um maybe just you know to to place that the containment as an idea back into the mythic image I mean, this would be another expression of the virginity of the core, that one is contained in the sense that the virgin is not available to, to being entered, so that she's defined in some way by being within herself. Um, and then we see that um, in relationship to some of the great Kore goddesses like Athena, who's always, who all, almost always wears a breastplate. So she has, she's kind of contained within that. Artemis, the goddess who sanctifies uh, solitude. So she's contained in the way that she um, withdraws from being around others, that there's this great sense of privacy. So that would be another dimension. So we can look at the myths and these figures to help us uh, explore what that is. Now, so I think containment or contained integrity and what that means in terms of the core is that I, I think it has to do with being in touch with our inner world, that, that we, that, that in the midst of our lives, which of course are lived outwardly and in our relationships and in our creative endeavors, there is an inner world. And that inner world is where our, our values, our visions of who we are becoming, our emotional intelligence and understanding, it, it lives with it, it lives within as a, as a kind of psychological space inside, you know, but let's just think of that more metaphorically. And so the core um, points to the necessity to have a relationship to our interiority and to know that that needs to be at times protected, that there have to be boundaries around that. And that can mean, you know, perhaps for some people, like myself, they have a very rich and um, you know, kind of private personal practice, you know, journaling and contemplative practices, spiritual practices, whatever those might be. So that might be one expression of the Corey's contained integrity. But another expression of it would be the ways in which we defend our values in 
response to those that come from outside us. So contained integrity would be like, I remember hearing in a lecture by Clarissa Pinkola Estes, she said something to the tone of, my inner knowing is more valid than your collective approval. See, that's an expression of contained integrity, right? That we stay grounded in the sense of what's true for me and that that can't be penetrated or um, ruptured or compromised. So that, so that would be a, a, a more lived expression, let's say, of like how we do contained integrity. Now, the shadow of that would be when we're defended so the shadow of that core kind of piece would be like, I'm not letting your opinion in. I'm not letting your needs in. Like I'm kind of completely uh, enclosed within myself. So there, there can be shadow expressions of it. So there is something about being able to be in integrity with ourselves that at the same time is open and receptive to what is in our life, uh, to what others need, but that doesn't sort of throw us off our ground, that we can both be um, um, rooted and, you know, kind of flexible and, and permeable to some degree. Yeah. And I think um, like versus being walled in uh, or iron, ironclad with our container um, to being psychologically fluid. And it's it's hard to, to get to that fluidity. And I think therapy does help that process. And similarly to the core, the container is challenged. And we, we learn a way of kind of living uh, in a, symbiotically with our environment while versus running away fully or being right. too taken by it. So just right, find exactly. kind of like happy medium uh, right. and how important that is for, for realizing or letting the core uh, really emerge. Yes, exactly. And, and like, that's a lifelong work, isn't it? <laughs> like, you know, finding that sort of middle place. And I think that's, yeah. And, but see the core gives us she, she's a figure that helps us locate that work and those values and needs in the the mythic background in the archetypal imagination and when we don't have figures who um sanctify these needs, the need for privacy, the need to not be a fulfillment of everyone's expectations of who I am. When we don't have these numinous, you know, imaginal figures that personify that, we, be, we begin to think there's something wrong with us. We personalize these problems or these issues. The Corey gives us the archetypal background that we need to connect these values, these problems, these questions and concerns to something far deeper and greater than just me as an individual, you see. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm just thinking about, um, you know, the difference where Jung like makes the distinct uh, the distinction between you know navel gazing or being self involved versus this is this is a process of actually kind of coming into a, a lesion between the self and the ego and so that we can live out in the world uh, relationally um, right. but at the same time be in contact with what would have been called that still soft voice right. that it's a place of home where we can go to love the self and and be our our whole self that we can't be out in the world uh, and and how do we help that emerge without meeting with it and right. really time with it uh outside right. of all of those expectations so that brings me to this 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 idea of integrity and soul making that you talk about yes. and i think if we talk about anything today related to the core that that is most important for my listeners and i think a lot of them do have questions they're very interested in this stuff but they also often ask me you know how do i do this <laughs> like, oh, how do i be in integrity in this thing called soul making or yeah. Or like, how do I do this work? And I think this is a big part of that, mm. uh, having integrity and soul making. But like, how yeah. would you describe that? Well, I would describe that as being, you know, it's like the, the effort to live the reality of the core 
involves being in touch with what it is that we value. What it is that what is it that I really value and what matters to me? What are the ideals that I that my the, or the principles that my life really wants to be in service to? Um, what is my emotional response and truth to this situation or complex or issue that I'm caught in? See, integrity would be being in touch with those things. And, and that I think often means having to recognize the ways in which we have um, um, invested a certain amount of our identity in being attuned to what others think are, is valuable or how I should be in response to this situation or what would it look like to put on my big girl pants and just kind of, you know, get over this problem. See, I think that the, the, the being an integrity and soul making on one level has to do with really being aware of our inner reality and where do we, um, um, what are the different fantasies? And I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, but in a psychological sense, what are the different fantasies, meaning stories that work in my vision and my mode of interpreting what's going on that take me out of myself, that make me um, um, always be wondering who I must respond to and who must I please now. Integrity has to do with being aligned in that, that my being, my sense of who I am, my feeling reality, and the way I then act in the world that th those things are in alignment. So if we think about integrity in the field of music, it's, it means in the most simple but beautiful sense that there's alignment, that there's harmony. Um, so that being, feeling, and doing are all together, that they, they, they resonate, they're in accord, basically. And, and, that, and, and that, to me, begins in that whole, in our relationship to our inner reality, our emotional life. And then developing the kind of core muscle maybe which is um really trying to stay close to our authenticity yeah and I love that um just in what you were just talking about kind of bringing up for me this the the necessity to really appreciate the lived experience and that in soul making that's really what we're doing we're giving priority in our integrity to the process and really being here for it being here for yeah. the mystery and that the soul making is is a big part of that in in why we turn to stories and why we turn to myths because it gives us an opportunity an alembic to understand our own story and how important right. it is our yes. our inner fantasies and, and and what really is going on for us uh as a larger story That's right. uh, which kind of like I, I think brings us to spirited agency mm. um, and I loved this. I loved this concept. It's one of my favorite ones in the book. So uh, <laughs> if you could well, tell me what, what you love about it, I'd like to hear your thought. Yeah, uh, I feel like it resonates with me in my process and something that almost feels like a something that I can't help. You know, it's a, it's like an, when you have integrity in the soul making, there's this deep love, I think, and that brings mm -hmm. you to spirited agency and that you yes. can act um, in alignment with that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it, it helps manifest things that otherwise wouldn't or that are meant to for you, I think. Um, right. But acting out of that center. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah, I love that because, you know, um, the core as an archetypal figure is anything but passive. That's one of the reasons why virgin maiden were words that I didn't want to, I, I wanted to open up our vocabulary. Um, because because there's a, agency is such a profound dimension of the core and the goddesses that personify the core, you know, they are sovereign. They have ultimate agency over what they do and their their fields of territory. And so so that is a really important dimension of Corehood as a psychological reality or the way the core lives in us. She, she personifies um, our sense of being able to move at will in our life. 
And that the movement at will, that that movement coming out of the whole sense of integrity is based on something authentic, an authentic need that I have, um, an authentic desire or vision about where I want to go. And that's, and the spirited agency of the core is that which says, when I am aligned with that truth, this there's a fire, it's like the, the solar fire of my creative vitality comes in and the spirit meets with the ground of being and we are able to move with uh, purpose and and focus and a sense of rightness toward that thing you know which ha has emerged you know whatever that might be a creative project or um discovering a new way of relating to a, an ongoing problem or uh, view or, or whatnot so um yeah that that spirited agency so I that that was very important to try to draw out um that kind of there's an active dimension it's like the core and and this was you know for people that check out the book that's why I brought in these archaic Greek statues or well one way one of the reasons I think they're so so potent as an image is that they stand so erect <laughs> it's like they take their stand in the world and they say I am here um, she's not sitting she's not lying down you know there, there's nothing um sort of restful but there is this kind of serene intense presence and I think that that evokes something of this feeling of spirited agency that belongs to the archetype. But as I also talk about in the book, I think one of the ways in our personal lives and in our memories that we can find the core, like for those people listening, they're like, well, where is she in my, in my life? I think one of the most potent places where we can, uh, reflect and try to discover her is in images for women, images of ourselves as young girls, you know, eight, nine, 10, when we were, you know, spunky and, you know, a bit what we maybe old school, you know, how we used to call, you know, girls could be called tomboys, you know, when whatever, what the, the, just that kind of interesting period of time. But I think even into um, adolescence, where there was a sense of like being oneself, even in the midst of whatever difficult family life circumstances we've all come through, there's something in our youthful memories of ourselves and our youthful selves that was very still so close to a sense of our spirited agency. You know, like the sense of possibility, the sense of newness and the fire to go after it like the clarity of knowing what I like. I like this. I don't like this. You know what I mean? Like that belongs to that, you know, our tweeny, you know? Yeah. So anyway, like the fearlessness of the self before it was too conscious, you know, it just exactly and after it. Exactly. Right. Yes. That fearlessness. I, I, I think that that belongs to that sense of spirited agency. Right. Yeah, it's bringing up aspects of um, also spring when we think of the seasons and kind of where we are now as a, a collective and when we have these experiences of just newness and like when we can get back to this um, kind of, we had get this energy to go out into the world. And that's like another right. aspect of nature uh, presenting that spirited agency in a, in a timely manner that we can't feel it all the time, but we do in waves and cycles and to, to bring her back and, and why we would need to touch base with this aspect of ourselves, uh, especially when we're working through all the ways that that crust has formed. And one of them being our wounding over time, um, totally. fighting forth in a world that really has a, occluded so much of the these aspects for us as women but also for for men and our soul work mm -hmm. uh so you mentioned earlier aspects of this in terms of the mother and i'm i mm. I'd love to talk a little bit about um you know what these trials are that corey goes through in terms of the mother and what those okay. obstacles are right so so again to move into the, the the archetypal dimension the mother as an archetype some of the qualities that we relate to that pattern 
is containing like so not contained integrity in the way that we are talking about the core but holding right we can think of the womb or the breast or you know the vulva you know and and the mother's embrace and the mother's lap i mean think about all these gorgeous images we have of mary holding christ the mother holds and contains she receives um so so as a and then i think we could say that the mother as an archetypal process has to do with keeping everything connected and also a kind of abundant fertility that also belongs to the great mother archetype, like abundant creativity, more babies, more new life. You know, it's like the fields always giving rise to grain and veg and, you know, full blossoming. All of, all of those things have a kind of um, large abundance to them. And and wants there to be constant connection and even merging. Whereas the core stands for the values of being an individual and standing apart and also the recognition of our limitations. And so in that sense, the core and the mother archetypes really are profoundly distinct archetypal patterns with their own values. And the, and the trouble is, as in myth, we see this with Demeter and Persephone, the great mother and the core, that the mother keeps trying to hold the core in. She doesn't want to let the core go. She resists, and that's the nature of that archetypal worldview, resisting separation, resisting differentiation and distinction. Whereas that is the core's essence. So that becomes one of the kind of fundamental challenges, challenging dynamics that just belongs to the relationship between these two archetypes. And obviously, I think, you know, uh, we live that in some of the most intimate, profound ways, many women in their relationships with their mother. So we live this personally, but this is actually an archetypal problem. And again, it, 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 there's great medicine in being able to locate that at that level, isn't there? You know, I was yeah. thinking about what that means in terms of, you know, analysis or even our personal processes that we know about archetypally with the mother, uh, obviously Demeter, but something of, you know, when we have only mother or only archetypal mother, uh, the core or the, the daughter becomes that becomes that self for the mother and to lose that uh, because it's externalized or not integrated um, right. is, is such a grief for Demeter. That's right. Um, for so many right. reasons that she right. and integrate her own sense of self. That's right. Right. And, and there's no, and there, 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 and I don't think we, we should judge the, 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 the values of the great mother. Of course, she doesn't want to let go of her daughter because that is the very nature of that whole sort of worldview, which is to keep everything close. The problem comes when we are negotiating these archetypal needs in our lives and where does the mother kind of take over? So for example, you know, wh where and how in our lives do we think we need to take care of everyone and everything all of the time? And how does that occlude that kind of inner work, maybe the Artemisian work of being able to withdraw into some space of solitude to reconnect to, well, what's really important to me now? Or, um, you know, and see, that's a very basic, I think a very direct way where we can recognize how these archetypal patterns are at work in us. From the point of view of the mother, um, the core turning in on herself to be alone could be called selfish. How often have we been called selfish for wanting to pursue something that we know is really important to us? See, that's the call of the core to do that. But the judgment comes from, you know, this other view, but, you know. Yeah, I just, um, I'm, I'm thinking about, 
you know, in the work with, with some clients, it's, or the, as long as I've been a therapist, it's been such a struggle to get people to be alone with themselves. And I think it's, it's such a Jungian thing, uh, such an archetypal thing that yes. you know, it's different than I think, you know, if we consider it on a certain level, especially imaginally, how important it is to be with our interiority. Uh, yes. And to have um, that aspect of selfishness, or and in in, we wouldn't really call it that, but just going off of what you're, how other people right. see it sometimes, and that yeah. we need to have that space. We have to have a magic metaphorical circle that we go to uh, to do this work. Absolutely. And so there's the invocation of Hecate. We could talk about Hestia or Artemis or even Athena. But I think the one of the reasons why there's such a uh, sort of difficulty around and a need to talk to people about this is because at least here in the United States, we have a very extroverted culture. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, those are the values. It's like the way we're turned out and plugged in. And, you know, so, so this is, I, I think this is another kind of archetypal collision, we could say. Um, um, that the world of the core and the values that she personifies in many respects stand in resistance and contrast to what in our culture is really held up as um, important and valuable and, and makes sense. <laughs> and I think uh, in the in terms of this work, we would say that going going in, into your interiority and having a sense of aloneness at times uh, and being comfortable with that uh, is something that allows us to be out in the world, allows us to right. be in, in better community. So it's not in terms of isolation, but but for the greater aspects of our, of the collective to go into our interiority. So you were, as you were mentioning, you were bringing some of them up, but um, I want to move on to the triad goddesses. Of course, oh. I have a very special place in my heart for this. So triad, triform, anything that symbolizes our multiplicity, of course, which is what yes. we're really talking about um, yes. becoming conscious of. So um, can you tell me what the significance is for, for the core? Eh? I mean, we talked a little bit about it today, but uh, just to elaborate a little bit. On the, on the sort of multiplicity or on the triad goddesses? The triad goddesses. Yeah. You know, the significance of them. Yeah. So, um, I mean, in one sense, so this is my more like scholarly side. I really wanted to bring the triad goddesses into our mythic archetypal discussion. You know, it's like these goddesses don't really get talked about. We pay attention, at least in Greek myth, to the Olympian pantheon and Hecate and all wonderful, profound figures. But I really wanted these other figures to just get drawn in and that people could begin to further expand their sense of the, um, um, the stories. So, so there was that piece. So that, that's my, the, my more scholarly reason for wanting to include them. But then the other piece is that when you start to look at some of these triads, and that includes the fates and the furies and the graces and the hours, these are extraordinarily complex like dimensions of life that these goddesses relate to. Fate, I mean, wow, I mean, you know, what, a library can be filled with books that have been written about this whole notion of fate for and against and all of that. Um, or fury, the emotion of fury um, and the necessity of fury and um, what it is to seek vengeance against values that have been betrayed. See, that's what the furies uh, personify, the, the rightness of, of fury when certain values or necessities have been violated. See, that relates to the core. It's like a dark face of the core that says, when this boundary or this, um, this um, uh, thing that matters to me has been disregarded or run roughshod or completely uh, dismissed, the fury that emerges in us, that's archetypally true. That is right, and the furies shine a light on that, on on the on the the rightness of that kind of emotional response. So, and 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 each of those triads 
kind of give us another piece, I think, of some of these core values. Like, for example, the hours, you know, I'm an astrologer. So, of course, I love these goddesses that are related to time and the seasons. But the hours have to do with ripeness, meaning like the issue of right timing and being in sync with right timing. And we can obviously think about that in an external way, like when everything kind of lines up and then finally we can kind of move toward that thing we've been planning. But I think as Kore goddesses, the the hours point to the ways in which we can be in touch with the rhythm of our own nature so that we know what our right timing is in relationship to having that conversation that needs to be had or really beginning to dedicate time to some creative endeavor. That it's not about, oh, well, I need my next book to come out. So I've got to start working on this now, or I can't hold the tension anymore of this problem in this relationship. It's like being kind of driven by external expectations or more complex complex driven uh, knee-jerk reactions, the hours as Kore goddesses talk about discovering what our own inner rhythmic right timing is and and, and being in relationship to that in our life. So yeah, so those are just a couple of examples. Yeah, Kairos time. Kairos, yeah. Time that's, uh, you know, in alignment. Yes. Yes. You're bringing up uh, fury and vengeance, <laughs> it's like very close to some of my favorite archetypal feminine energies with the dark goddess. And what yeah. I truly have found in my research is that we have to feel on a level, a primordial level, uh, let let our uh, core kind of like rise through that feeling, which is a big part of my research with the phoenix archetype yes. uh, but also in the process of reddening like letting ourselves feel yes. all of the emotions that we can't leave those out when we're working with her um, because that's a part of the the truth that's been suppressed that's um, right and, and that helps. helps us to like emotions are archetypal that they they have they have whole mythologies and figures that personify them. And so that also helps us, I think, get out of this kind of like personal sense of responsibility for feeling what I'm feeling. It's an, you know, it's an archetypal uh, response to something. And, and you know, as, as, you know, Hellman, you know, that it's right to feel angry. <laughs> you know, the anger is appropriate given the things that are happening in the world. And, you know, so like, how do we not, yeah, so um, yeah, the Furies and the dark goddesses, they all help us begin to relate to that in a new way, in a less uh, judgmental way. Yeah, and just to, to, to sit with uh, the reality of what is coming up. Uh, and that a big part of her is what has been really ignored this whole whole time. I think when I get I get into the feelings with soul and anima mundi and, and yeah. when we do our soul work, I think it depends where you're at, but I think you genuinely feel the, the anger or you feel something. Uh, anger is like not, it doesn't even do it justice when you feel like the, the, the pain of soul. Um, mm. and people are, are fear that or are afraid of that. And I think that's... Mm-hmm. You know archetypally true but when we feel into our own energy of like the triadic uh in our kind of complexity and in, mm-hmm. in the sense of our femininity uh and soul i think that's kind of the gist of what we're really getting at when we're thinking about the core and, and yes. how we differentiate and yes. then bring it back together as a whole that's uh, right. so just to kind of conclude, I mean, I'm thinking about my research selfishly and thinking about Hecate. Uh, mm-hmm. and she's, she's not a triad goddess because I was like reading through and I was like, I wonder if she'll come up. And she, right. and I was like, well, you know what? She's not. She's not many things. She just sits in many directions and can access many spaces mm-hmm. uh, as, you know, a multiplicity. But she's not many in that way. Right. And that, and that was my focus, which is the... The, the many who are known as one and 
Hecate is kind of the opposite. She's she's the one who, as you say so beautifully, looks in many directions, which I really love. Um, yeah, so she she sat differently in terms of the motif that I was trying to um, explore, um, but she's fierce and she's Ooh. totally a Corey goddess. So, you know, if I am, I don't know, if I end up maybe doing a revised version, maybe I'll, I'll have to bring Hecate in a bit. <laughs> of course she's a Corey goddess, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, in many, <laughs> in many spaces also considered Artemis herself. So right. Artemis being a Corey, uh, that, that is an aspect of, of Hecate's um, maiden energy uh, but technically not the mother maiden and crone so right uh, right <laughs> um, all right well it was really really great to talk to you and i think this probably helped illuminate and exp explicate so much of the book for those that have already read it and maybe encouraging those that haven't to, to go pick it up uh, because it's so central to this work uh, for both men and women to understand this aspect uh, and I just wanted to say say thank you for for letting everybody hear your thoughts on this and, and for the work overall that you've done. I really admire your your scholarship. Thank you, Alexis. I, I really appreciate uh, being able to talk with you about the Core and um, you know the ways in which you are also like dedicated to bringing greater understanding um, and connection to the the values um, and themes that belong to this archetype in, in our life. But thanks for inviting me to talk about her. It was a pleasure and hopefully we'll have you back. Please. <laughs>